All Cars, a copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Fresno County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all sheriff's cars broadcast 241 regarding a robbery. Be on the lookout for two bandits described as Americans, 35 years old, weighing about 150 pounds each. One man is approximately 5 feet 5 inches, the other described as being tall. These men held up and robbed the First National Bank at Carruthers. That's all. Those included. <laughs> robberies are not committed by men with guns. Lurking in the shadows of every inferior motor oil are two of the most notorious highway robbers at large today, wear and tear. Egged on by their undercover agents, Sludge and Carbon, they pounce on the unsuspecting motorist who thinks all is oil that glitters to steal his pocketbook and leave his innocent motor weak and helpless from their brutal beating. Fortunately, there is a motor oil that refuses to harbor these two enemies of efficient motoring, and its name is Real Lube, the lubricant that emerges from the largest, most modern refinery in the country, clean and undefiled. No sludge or other carbon-forming elements are allowed to remain in Real Lube, and that's why it is superior, defying the outside influences of extreme heat and the inside stress of high speed to break down its morale. Strong and smooth, this better lubricant really lubricates all of your motor's moving parts all the time from the instant you step on the starter until you tuck it away in the garage at the end of the day. When you save your motor, you save money. You save dollars when you use common sense and use Real Lube, the newest and finest motor oil in the West. The story we're to hear tonight has been taken from the confidential files of the Fresno County Sheriff's Office. And we have therefore asked Sheriff George J. Overholt to open our program. Sheriff Overholt. One of the fundamental things for witnesses to do in the case of a holdup is to try and get an accurate description of the holdup man and to be definitely sure of that description. In the story we are to hear tonight, a great deal of confusion resulted from the failure of witnesses to obtain accurate descriptions of the bandits involved, and further confusion was added by a coincidence which shall which we shall hear related later in the program. A significant fact regarding one of the men involved in this story was that although he admitted robbing more than 30 banks in California, and although he had spent his entire life as a criminal, he had left at the time of his sentence $175 to show for a life of crime. Definitely, his 25 years of criminal activity netted him practically nothing and proved most conclusively that crime is not a paying proposition. At exactly 20 minutes to 3 o'clock on the afternoon of April 16, 1931, two men walked into the First National Bank in Carruthers. All right, lady, get them up. Get in that cage, Bill, and get the money. What is this? Why do you guys always ask the same questions? This is a stick-up. You build the money and tell that other dame over there to get back in the vault. You don't have to tell her anything. She's already in the vault putting the money away. Well, you stand still and get that money bill in that sack and let's go. Get started, pal. We're ready to go. You two dames go right on working just like nothing was happening. Go on, Bill. Out the back door. Irma, throw that burglar alarm switch while I call the sheriff's office. <laughs> The scene is the courtroom of the Superior Court, Fresno County, a few weeks later. It is the intention of the people to prove that the two defendants, the Brown brothers, now on trial, are the men who, on the afternoon of April 16th, walked into the First National Bank at Carruthers and, at the point of a gun, forced the assistant cashier, Miss Hammond, and an employee, Miss Noblet, to deliver some $2,000 in currency and silver to the bandits. And thereafter... Said bandits fled from the scene of their crime and were later apprehended and charged with bank robbery. Call Mrs. Jacobs. Mrs. Jacobs. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this case is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. State your name. Ida Jacobs. Take the stand, please. Now, Mrs. Jacobs, where were you on April 16th at the time of this robbery? I was sitting on my front porch talking to a neighbor. Did you see the two men, the defendants, drive away from the bank that afternoon? Yes, sir. 
Are you positive it was the same two men now on trial? Yes, sir. How do you identify them? Well, uh, one of them was a tall fellow. I would say over six feet, uh, rather slow walking. The other man was a younger, shorter man. I would say about five feet and a half. And he appeared very nervous. Did you see them when they left the bank? Yes, sir. What did they do? They came out of the back door of the bank and they jumped in their car and drove off. They went west on 6th Street. About what time was this? Oh, I don't know exactly, but it was almost 3 o'clock. Can you describe the automobile they drove? Well, it was sort of a grayish tan color. I don't know what make it was, but it looked like a Chevrolet or, or something like that. It was a roadster with a cloth top, and I noticed that the radiator had been boiling over and the windshield was all splashed with muddy water. Did you get a good look at the face of either of these men? Well, sort of. Could you identify them positively as the men who are here in this courtroom? I think so. Do you see those men now? Yes, sir. Will you point them out? Those two men right there at that table. Thank you, Mrs. Jacobs. Call Miss Hammond. Naomi Hammond. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this case is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. State your name. Naomi Hammond, Carruthers, California. Miss Hammond, will you explain the circumstances surrounding the holdup of the First National Bank at Carruthers on April 16th? Well, it was about 20 minutes to 3. We were getting ready to close up when these two men walked into the bank and told us it was a holdup. By these men, do you mean the two defendants in court? Well, I, I'm not positive that they are the same two men. Go ahead, please. Well, uh, two men walked in, as I said, and told us that we were being held up. I was in the teller's cage, and Miss Noblet was in the vault putting away some money. Uh, one of the men, uh, the short one, appeared very nervous. He came back of the railing and into the cage and took uh, the money I had in there, and then he went into the vault and took the money that Irma was putting away. The other fellow stayed outside at the window and held a gun. Did you see the faces of either of these men? No. They were both masked. Well, then you can't say positively that the two defendants now in court are the men who came into the bank on April 16th. No, not positively. Although I'm sure they, they are the same two men. That is all, Miss Hammond. Thank you. Uh, call Mr. Campbell. And Campbell. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this case is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. State your name. Hans Campbell. Mr. Campbell, did you on the afternoon of April 16th see the two men who are now defendants in this case? I'm pretty sure they are the same men. Will you explain the circumstances under which you saw these men? Well, at about 2.30 in the afternoon of April 16th, as I was leaving Carruthers, going west on 6th Street, I saw a car approaching and noticed that the motor was very hot and that the car was boiling and it threw muddy water over the windshield and saw that the windshield wiper said to be used. Uh, what kind of a car was this? I wasn't able to make out the kind of a car it was, except that it was a roadster with a cloth top, a sort of a grayish tan color. Could you identify the two men now in court as the ones you saw in the car? Well, I'm pretty sure they are the same men. Did you notice any other marks of identification on the car? Well, I saw that the left rear fender had been bent and the car had no license plate. Also, one of the taillight lenses had been broken out. Did it have a spare tire? Uh, no, sir. Not that I noticed. You don't know what make or model car it was? Uh, no, sir. It looked like a Chevrolet, although I'm not sure. It might have been some other car. That is all. Thank you. Mr. H.K. Anderson. H.K. Anderson. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this case is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. State your name. H.K. Anderson, Constable Carruthers, California. Be seated. Uh, Mr. Anderson, you are a peace officer? Yes, sir. Constable. Did you, on April 16th, have occasion to make an investigation of a robbery at the Carruthers First National Bank? Yes, sir. Uh, tell us what you did on that occasion. Well, I got a call that the bank had been held up. So I went down and talked to the girls who were on duty. Got as good a description as I could of the bandits. Then I notified the sheriff's office in Fresno. Deputy Ford and Deputy Martin came down, and the three of us made a few inquiries around Carruthers. Finally, we found that the wife of one of these defendants had made a statement which led us to believe that they were involved in this holdup. And what was that statement? Well, she told a woman who lived in Hanford that there was going to be a lot of excitement in that neighborhood before night. And how do you know this? Uh, we talked to the woman who'd heard her say this. Did you check this story? Yes, sir. And we found that Mrs. Brown had made the statement. Did she explain the statement? Well, she told us that the night before, a man had come to their house and had made her husband a proposition. I tell you, Joe, you can't lose. This dump's a cinch. 
We'll get five or six grand out of there without any trouble. Yeah? Well, how are you going to get away with yeah, it? It's a cinch, I tell you. Now, here's a way to work it. You start out from here and you're across, see? Uh-huh. You stop somewhere where you're known, but give yourself plenty of time to get over there at their bank before it closes. Yeah. You hold it up and get back to the place where you stopped the first time so you have an alibi. Yeah, but somebody's bound to recognize the car. That's the point I'm coming to. There ain't no reason why nobody should. And here's what you do. After you leave the place where you're setting up your alibi, you drive like a bat out of... Well, you drive fast to make up some time, see? Then you stop somewheres and paint your car with this here calcimine. Calcimine? Yeah, you know, the stuff you paint walls with. You just mix up in a glass jar with some water and paint the car with it. Uh, what good will that do? Hey, you'd be surprised how it will confuse the witnesses. Oh, I see. But how can you get the stuff off? Well, you just wash it off. Just uh, get a hose and turn it on the car. The stuff comes right off. Well, don't it hurt the car? No, it even makes it look better. Well, what do you care? You're getting 5000 bucks, ain't you? Here, you can buy a new car. Uh, I don't know. It, it's a pretty risky proposition. Oh, there's nothing to it, I tell you. Listen, you and Hook can make the trip over there in an hour. Knock this bank over and be back. I don't like the looks of it. Now, well, listen, Bob. You told Hoib and me that you would work with us on any deal we cooked up, didn't you? Yeah, but I didn't mean anything like this. Well, we didn't know that. We got this thing all planned. And while you do this here job, we're going to take the bank down in Chester. Uh, I don't want to get mixed up in any more trouble, Bill. There ain't no point in it. I'm getting along. I got a job. My wife's got a job. And I don't want any part of this kind of a deal. I'm uh, not sissing, guy. Hoib's going to be madder than the devil when I tell him about this. Well, let him get mad. Who cares? I'm not going to have anything to do with it. That's the story she told us. She said her husband had gone out on a fishing trip at the time the bank was robbed... And that what she meant by there being a lot of excitement was that she was sure this other gang was going to hold up the bank. Were you able to establish who this other gang was? No, sir. Well, did you make any further investigation? Well, we inspected the brown automobile, compared the tire marks of the ones we found in the alley back of the bank. They were similar, and the two front tires were the same. What kind of a car was this? It was a new Pontiac. It had a bent fender on the left-hand side. The license plates were put on with new bolts showing they'd been recently removed. And what was the condition of the taillight? Well, it looked like any other taillight. Had a glass in it. Did it show evidence of having been recently replaced? Oh, I couldn't tell. Well, did you find anything else peculiar about the car? Well, it had a grayish tan substance in the cracks around the body on the windows and running board. Did you find out what this material was? Yes, sir. The sheriff's office had Dr. Twining make an analysis of the material. He stated that it was calcimine. Did you question the defendants regarding the supposed fishing trip? Uh, yes, sir, but the, the story that Bob told didn't jibe with the story that his brother told. Did you question them separately? Yes, sir. And they told conflicting stories of their actions on the afternoon of April 16th? Yes, sir. Did you retrace the route over which the two defendants said they traveled on that afternoon? We did, and we found that it was possible to drive from the point they claimed they started from, hit Carruthers, and return to that point within the time they admitted had elapsed. In other words... You drove from the home of the defendants to the bank at Carruthers and back again in approximately an hour. Yes, uh, they told us that they left home about 2 o'clock that afternoon. I'd gotten back about 4.30. We allowed an hour for the trip each way and found we had uh, approximately 30 minutes to spare. Did you again question the defendants regarding their statements? Yes, I did. They again told conflicting stories regarding their activities that afternoon. Bob finally told me that he'd lent his car to a fellow named Thomas, who'd had it washed and polished that afternoon, and that he'd told Thomas to put in a new taillight lens. That Thomas had stopped at a garage and had this work done. And did you check with this garage? Oh, yes, sir, I did. The work had been done on the car, all right. But the garage man remembered that at the time, it was a grayish tan in color. He said the license plates were wired on, and that he'd put a new set of bolts in them. Uh, Mr. Anderson, did you find anything else that might point to the two defendants as the perpetrators of this holdup? Well, on the road over by Wilson Ranch, which is on the way from Carruthers to the place where these two boys live, we found a jar. It looked like it had had some sort of paint in it. We took it in to Sheriff Overholt, and he had Dr. Twining analyze it. The report was that it was calcimine, too. The same kind that we got out of the crevices in the car body. 
And uh, did you ascertain if this jar belonged to the defendants? Well, they claimed they never saw it before. That is all, Constable. Thank you. Hour after hour, the evidence piled up against the two defendants. Witness after witness identified the car or the men as having been seen near the place of the holdup. At last, the jury returned with its verdict. Has the jury reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. The clerk will accept the verdict and read it to the court. We, the jury, in the above-mentioned action, find the defendants guilty as charged. And so Bob Brown and his brother were sentenced to San Quentin for the robbery of the Carruthers First National Bank. At 20 minutes to 3 on the afternoon of December 31st, 1931, Naoma Hammond looked up from the pile of money she had been counting in the teller's cage of the First National Bank and Carruthers to look into the business end of a 38 revolver. All right, just get right on acting like nothing was happening, lady. This is a stick-up, so don't be so interested in what my face looks like. And Bill, get that money into that sack and let's get out of here. Don't be much here, Hoyt. I'll get what there is and let's get going. Okay, I got it. All right, lady. I'll take what you're counting there and you keep standing right where you are and don't make no moves to follow us. Come on, Bill. I'm a throw that burglar alarm switch. Oh, I'm getting tired. In the office of Sheriff Overholt, the sheriff confers with his deputies. Well, Ford, you worked on that case when the Brown boys were sent to San Quentin? Yes, sir. You heard about this new Carruthers job? Yeah, I heard about it this morning. Looks awfully suspicious to me that the same method of approach was used in both cases. Yes, it does look sort of funny. I talked to the two girls in the bank, and they tell me that the bandits are the same ones that held him up before. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think somebody's mistaken, because the two boys that did that job in April were in San Quentin. Well, it looks mighty peculiar to me. Those girls are positive that these are the same two men that held them up before. Yeah, they were pretty positive then. Yes, that's true. Nevertheless, I've got an idea that we've got the wrong men in San Quentin. Hmm? I don't know how it happened, but every bit of evidence pointed to those two boys. But it's a since they couldn't be in San Quentin and yet hold up this bank again. Oh, hardly. Uh, I want you to get Ed Martin and the two boys who worked with you on this case before and go over the ground very thoroughly out there in Carruthers and see what you can find. Okay. Sheriff? Sure. Baker here has been making some investigation on the bank robbery case. I think he's got some pretty interesting dope. Now, what have you found out, Baker? Well, yesterday when those boys knocked over the bank again, several of the fellows who were close by chased them in their cars out Marks Avenue. They doubled back on them, however, and at Elkhorn they transferred to a couple of other cars. One of them a roadster and one a coupe and got away. I took one of the boys out and had pictures made of the tire impressions of the cars. I find that one of them was equipped with a brand new set of Goodyear's. Nobody got much of a description of the cars, except for the fact that the Dodge they got away with in the first place was painted with Kelsomon. Kelsomon, huh? Yes. I found this box with 38 S&W shells and these three 25-35 rifle shells. Well, there's nothing to do but start looking for them. Back in his office, Sheriff Overhold dispatched teletype descriptions of the hold-up men together with all the information secured in Carruthers. Particular stress was laid on the calcimine disguise of the cars and on the new tire marks. Meanwhile, Deputy Sheriff John Ford and Ed Martin tracked the bandit car into King County. They were forced to abandon the chase when night fell, but early next morning, in company with Constable William Dalby of Hanford, they again took up the trail. And the long, tedious job of examining every driveway and side road leading to the different ranches in the vicinity of Hanford... At last, they discovered tire marks answering the description of those found in Carruthers. Ford and Martin immediately notified Sheriff Overholt, who sped to the ranch. Good morning, Mr. Green. Howdy, Sheriff. I wonder if you could tell us if any strange cars have been around here lately. Well, I, I don't know about strange cars. Why, Sheriff? Well, we noticed some fresh tracks on your driveway down there by the gate, and we were looking for a couple of cars that have been down this way. I wondered if you'd seen them. Well, Vince Herbert and Bill Thomas was by here last night. Uh, that is, yesterday afternoon, uh, about 3.30. You sure it was 3.30? Yes, I'm pretty sure. Uh, matter of fact, I, I looked at my watch about the time they left. What kind of a car were they driving? They were... Uh, they were driving a Nash Roadster. Did they say where they'd been? No, 
Uh, except that they just come down from Wilson Ranch. It's about a half mile up the road there. You happen to know whether this guy Herbert drives any other kind of car? Well, uh, I think sometimes he drives a Chevrolet coupe. Mm-hmm. Where do these boys live, Mr. Green? Over in Hanford somewhere. Most anybody over there can tell you. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Green. I think we'll take a run over to Hanford and see if we can find the boys. <laughs> like anybody's at home. Mm, sure, this is where they live. Yes, at least this is where Herbert lives. Let's take a look out in the garage first, see what we can find out there. Okay. I hate to have some guy take a pot shot at me out of one of those windows. Oh, they aren't apt to do anything like that. Yeah, no car here. Nope. But there are some nice, fresh Goodyear tracks. Hey, Sheriff, take a look at this. All right. There are eight twenty-five thirty-five caliber rifle shells. And here's a here's a chisel. It looks like it's been used recently, too. Yeah. I guess these are the boys we're after. Again, the machinery of the law. Again, the tedious process of shifting evidence. An expert testifies. The motor number had been chiseled out of the block on the Dodge car used in the holdup. And the body number had been cut out of the dash. Now, you will see by these enlarged photographs that the chisel marks correspond exactly with the point of the chisel which was found in the defendant's garage. Other experts testified that... The 25-35 caliber shells found in the garage of the defendant have at some time or other passed through the same rifle that fired the shells found in the Dodge car. Dr. Twining, the expert chemist testified that a calcimine scratched in the Dodge automobile is identical in composition with that found in the crevices of the Chevrolet Coupe and with the calcimine powder found on the floorboard of the luggage compartment of the Coupe. The defendant, Herbert, testifies... No, I wasn't in Carruthers on December 31st. I never left the barber shop till 2.30. Then I went over to the Carson's Tractor Company and I stopped in the filling station, changed the valve core. Then I drove right on down to the ranch. I don't know nothing about no holdup. Employees of the barbershop testified... Sure, I saw Vince Herbert in here about 2 o'clock on New Year's Eve. An employee of the tractor company said... I talked to Herbert on New Year's Eve sometime in the afternoon around 2 or 2.30. The service station attendant... Yes, I changed the valve core on the Chevrolet New Year's Eve about 2.30 in the afternoon. Thus, alibi after alibi was furnished by the defendant. At last, the verdict was returned. Not guilty. But Sheriff Overholt was convinced that something was wrong somewhere, that something had been overlooked. Having once been placed in jeopardy for bank robbery, it was impossible to place the defendants on trial again on that charge. But bank robbery in California also constitutes burglary. And the suspects were immediately charged with this offense and held in jail. In the meantime, the Sheriff of King County communicates with Sheriff Overholt. Sheriff's office, Ford speaking. Is uh, Overholt there? Just a moment. For you, Sheriff. Overholt speaking. Uh, this is Lofters down at Hanford. I think I've got the missing link in your bank case. That's so? Who is he? I picked up that fellow, Bill Thomas, for questioning on a stolen car, and I think he can give you some pretty good information about your friend Herbert. Okay, we'll come over and talk to him. I have pretty good evidence that this fellow Thomas is the bird who bought that dodge that was used in the Carruthers holdup. You know, the one they abandoned. How about that, Thomas? Well, yeah. Me and Frank Willis bought that car up in Berkeley. We got it off from a used car lot up there. All right, what do you know about this Carruthers job? Well, uh, me and Herbert held up the place the first time on the 16th of April last year. Hey, that's the job you set those other two boards up for. We sort of <laughs> fixed them up. How was that? Well, I... I went out to see one of them, and I, I tried to get him to come in with us on this here deal. On a corner, he had promised Hoib that he would help him out sometime on a job. Well, when this here guy finds out what kind of a job it was, he wouldn't go for it. So we grabs another jalopy that looked as much like his as we could, and we painted up with this here calcium, ma'am, and pulled that first job. Then we let the word get around that these here boys were simply... That, that these fellas were simply... That, that they was mixed up in this here deal. So you fellas could pick them up. We used the Chevy on that there job. But from the back, that looked just the same as the Pontiac these other guys was driving. So it was a cease to bring that job on them. And they'd have beat that rap if they'd stuck to their stories. But when you got that little one scared, 
He couldn't remember the places he had been to. Yeah, that was an easy job. What about the one on New Year's Eve? Yeah. There was four of us in on that one. You know, I thought for a while we wasn't going to get away with it. Especially when those guys started at foreigners and Coretta's. Yeah, we made it okay. And after we got out of town, we stopped and washed the cars off and burned our overalls. We always carried five gallons of gas and a bottle of water to clean the cars with. Were these the only banks you held up? Oh, no. Hey, listen, guy, we pulled that job at Crow's Landing and the one over Santa Cruz County. Oh, no, we have to have them up and down the line here. Listen, Hoib had to have the money. Well, what did he need the money so badly for? Well, he said, he's got a couple of boys in San Quentin, see? He was getting on a parole pretty soon. And he, well, he had to have money to send him up in business. What kind of business? What kind of a, Why, his business. He had their money to buy cars with. Hey, listen, guy. It takes money to rob banks. In just a moment, Sheriff Overholt will give us concluding facts on our program. Friends, a fellow may camouflage his car with trick hubcaps or calcimine, but he isn't fooling anyone for very long. Your motor knows the difference, and there's no use trying to slip one over. The men who drive your police cars, fire engines, and other must get their equipment know the difference, too. And that is why more of these emergency cars are powered by Rio Grande Cracked wherever this great gasoline is sold than any other brand. They know this better motor fuel for its quicker getaway, steadier acceleration, greater power, maximum speed, and consequent lower cost. So do your California state and federal officials so many of whom have nominated Rio Grande Crack to serve their most vital automotive equipment. Tens of thousands of shrewd motorists are saying, well, what's best for them surely is best for me. If you have shackled and handcuffed that car of yours in the past, set it free, friends. Give it an unconditional pardon with Rio Grande Crack, the motor fuel that lives up to its reputation as the most highly recommended gasoline in the West. And now, Sheriff Overholt. Needless to say, the two boys who had been sentenced to San Quentin were immediately pardoned. Unfortunately, no restitution could be made for the time they had spent in jail. It must be more borne in mind that they were positively identified as the men who held up the bank. The real bank robbers were brought to trial and speedily convicted and sentenced to prison while we hope they learn that crime is not a paying proposition. Thank you, Sheriff Overholt. <laughs> Fresno County Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all sheriff's cars, to cancellation of broadcast 241 regarding a bank holdup. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quit. Rick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande.